Hello and welcome to The Essential Oil Show. I'm Deborah Sophia Magdalene and today I'm delighted to have Jude Seawood with me as my guest. And we're going to be talking about autism and essential oils. Uh, Jude, welcome to the show. And uh, please could you describe to everybody what you do and why you know so much about essential oils in terms of autism and uh, ADD, ADHD? Hiya, Deborah. Uh, my background actually is fundamentally in, as a learning disability nurse. Uh, I trained oh, uh, eons ago, uh, too, too many to occur to mention. And over the years, I've ended up specialising in uh, behaviour, especially around autism, ADHD, and an unusual condition that people are beginning to know more about, which is pathological demand avoidance, which is part of the autistic spectrum disorders. Uh, so over the years, I've specialised at looking at behavioural interventions, looking at the function behind behaviours and that's gradually led me to look at alternative methods uh, to help support the people around their anxiety and dealing with their condition which has then led to using the oils. Cool and so um, I believe you've um, you know you've got quite a lot of experience in this area. Yeah uh, a lot of it's through working heavily with parents Yeah, uh, and actually hands-on support with the uh, with the parents. So it's around looking at research, looking at best practice, looking at what actually is happening in the world, but also then relaying it and adjusting it to meet people's needs. Uh, I've got a master's in research methodologies, which again has been very useful at looking and understanding the research. And I used to work in the NHS before I then left the NHS four years ago mm -hmm. and set up on my own, which has meant that I can use an awful lot of other skills. Uh, and it's not just kept to people with learning disabilities because the skills are transferable across the whole spectrum. Absolutely. Uh, can, can, Jude, can you talk us through some of the characteristics of autism? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, people talk about the triad of impairments, mm -hmm. which is used as a diagnostic guidance. So what they're looking for is that people with autism should have difficulties in communication, difficulties with social relationships, and difficulties with flexible thinking and that makes up the triad of impairments. So around communication, it might be around not knowing what to communicate, how to communicate, and understanding how language is used, especially the English language, it's so ambiguous. Mm. So we've got aspects where people will say, pull your socks up. Now people with autism quite often will take that very literal and will pull the socks up. Well, uh, we know we're actually meaning you've got to improve your, on yourself. You've got also difficulties with communication around processing. So we might give a lot of commands all in one go. So me and you are talking now and there's an awful lot to process because it's processing what our face is saying what our voice is saying, what the words are, and actually making that into sense. The difficulty we've got is that if people don't understand communication and body language, they miss so much on the communication side. We've also got difficulty with social relationships because they find it really hard to read people relationships break down and that social side about knowing how to time conversations, how to uh, actually deal with conflict, deal with uh, not having things your own way. These are skills we learn over time 
and they're not generally taught to us. We learn to deal with disappointment. We learn to uh, deal with anger. We learn to deal with uh, all the positive emotions as well, being happy. Nobody ever teaches us. And a lot of people on the spectrum have difficulty in actually understanding those aspects and dealing with them. That's, That's so wonderful. true, isn't it? Because, I mean, we, we take a lot of this for granted. But if, you're not, if you've got learning difficulties and you're not actually taught these skills, um, a lot of people could be actually missing out on those key things just because we assume that they know. Yeah. It's not even people with learning disabilities. You can have highly intellectual people who are on the spectrum who haven't picked up these skills. So it's not always down to intelligence. Mm. It's around how the brain works, which we'll probably go, we'll go into later on. But we've also got the difficulties around flexible thinking. Flexible thinking is actually knowing that I'm thinking one thing and you're thinking another. That leads back into the communication because if I don't realize that you're thinking something different, then why do I need to communicate something? So if I've got stomachache, why would I expect to need to tell you that I've got stomachache? Because if I've got stomachache, you'll be feeling the stomachache as well. And it's that understanding that actually you wouldn't know I've got stomachache until I tell you because we're all thinking something different. So there's that side of flexible thinking, but there's also the rigidity around flexible thinking. We can be having a conversation on oils, and then maybe when this is finished, we'll switch and talk about dogs. We yeah. can quickly switch from one topic to another and deal with it, because that's the way our brains work. We can read a book and instantly go and do a math problem because we can switch from one hemisphere of the brain to the other hemisphere of the brain. And that switching takes fractions of a second. Now, for people with autism, once they are working on one topic, they quite often find it difficult to move on to the next area without a natural transition. So that's that, really, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, are there any other additional difficulties that people have? Yes, there's a whole load of other issues. So a lot of people on the spectrum quite often have sensory difficulties. So they have difficulties in processing the world around them. So we might not notice uh, labels in our clothes or a design on a jumper, or if there's different fabrics, or where fabrics end, that might not bother us. It's like work, if you've always wear long pants in winter, the minute the sun comes out, we turn to shorts. We make that transition seamlessly. With sensory difficulties, people can pick up on those subtle differences. A label can feel as if it's a cutting knife in the back. Also, you've got all the senses, so you've got touch, taste, hearing, there's always one that I miss, sight. All those senses, which can be heightened. So what is a normal sound for us might suddenly become a piercing sound for them. Yeah, that's so true. I, I, I remember going on a course many years ago, and there was a man there that had ADD, ADHD, um, uh, he might have had autism as well, but he uh, was unable to stay in the room when there was music playing. He had to go out because it was like so loud in his ears. It was like, oh, just the big booming sound. And so every time the music played, he left the room. And that gave me a real appreciation for the difficulties that he must be going through, which I'd never appreciated before. Yeah. And people overlook that. We you can actually break sensory issues down into proprioception, which is knowing where your body is. And the way I liken proprioception is that when you've had a few drinks, you think you've got better spatial awareness than you have, and you forget where your body is. So after 
do too many drinks, you bump into walls because you don't realise where your body is. Mm. Imagine having that difficulty 24-7, but without the alcohol. Where you, you've got no spatial awareness, you don't know where your body is, and sometimes you get very dizzy from it. People, again, overlook those sides. We've got motor difficulties. So a lot of the people will have difficulties with fine motor skills, gross motor skills, but also the simple task of walking. Sometimes we do it automatically and we never think about walking. For some of these people, they have, they have to consciously think about where are the feet going, how are they walking. So that becomes extremely tiring. And again, people overlook those aspects. Again, people have problems with self-organizing. We naturally go down and put things in order. So we know how to organize things. We know how to plan things for the day. But for someone with the autistic spectrum, with on the, on the autistic spectrum, it can be very difficult. They might not know which order to put things in in a logical manner. What is logic to them might not be a practical logic. Yeah. So again, there's difficulties there. Because they don't understand the world either, they often have a lot of phobias, obsessions, and the only way that they can deal with that is by having rituals where they can control the environment and the structure because they can't deal with that unpredictability. This causes depression, and quite often it'll lead to stress and anxiety which we always recognise that people with autism always have a high level of stress and anxiety, which impacts on how they deal with life as well. And of course, stress and anxiety is something that's prevalent in society as a whole. Um, where does this stress and anxiety actually come from? Right. The main part of what controls our stress and anxiety response system is within the limbic system. So the limbic system is made up of variety different uh, oh, I'm just trying to think of the words of different components which all do different things. So I'm going to take you through roughly what each area does. Okay. So we've got the hypothalamus and this one is used for homeostasis neurohormones secretion body urges thirst appetite emotion regulation autonomic motor functions and works with the pineal gland so really the hypothalamus looks at what hormones we need yeah how do we know if we're thirsty how do we know if we're hungry how do we know if we need the toilet all those are fundamentally run by the hypothalamus. Yeah. Yes, there are other parts of the brain that impact on that. But the first part of the brain formation that deals with that is the hypothalamus. And we've got to remember that the way the brain is formed is we have the reptilian part first, which is your main stem that formed first. And then we have the limbic system. And then on the formation of those, the rest of the brain is formed. So if we have a problem within this area, it will have an impact on the rest of the brain. Oh. So that leads us to the thalamus. The thalamus is used for auditory processing, visual processing, motor control, regulation of sleep and uh, generally looks at the sensory aspects so if you're thinking about what we were saying before about sensory overload and processing yes again there's other parts of the brain that deal with that but this is the first part that sets it in place it relays also information 
to the rest of the body. So if there's a fault within the thalamus, messages might not be getting to the body. We might have a pain in our big toe, but it might be feeling in our body as if we've got stomachache. Oh, that's really interesting. So it's those type of things that we overlook again, that we don't realise that the limbic system's a vital part of our body and the brain. The hippocampus, this deals with memory, both long-term and short-term memory. It works closely with the amygdala, which we'll discuss later, but also it has a memory around spatial awareness. So we know when we walk through a door, how big the door is, we can judge it and walk through it without bumping into it. Mm -hmm. Our brain has memorized and remembered bumping into it. So we know what is needed spatially to be able to walk through the door. And that is part of what the hippocampus does. It actually stores it. So all these things that we're learning over time goes into the hippocampus. So we can use it and access it. And we don't need to think about using it. We don't suddenly look at the door frame and go, oh, let's analyze this. Yeah, it's automatic. Yes. That's how quick this brain works. And also it makes sense of all the information coming in. So again, that can be processed and sent out to the rest of the body. I hate saying this word. The cingulate gyrus. Good grief, the what? The cingulate gyrus? Yeah. They okay, don't, what, what, does that, what does that mean? They don't pick easy names for the parts of the brain. They don't call them Fred or Sid. I wish they would. Now, this looks at the emotion formation and processing. It looks at emotional learning and the processing of that information. It looks at behavioral outcomes. So it's a, very much involved in looking at why. Why is this motivating for me? Why is this good? Now, you and I hug frequently. We do. Yes. And this part of the brain actually is one of the main parts that processes it because it's saying, why do we hug? Why do we like it? What is the motivation behind having that hug? And it's around, it feels good. It's a good way to connect. No words are needed. Mm. A hug is a hug, whether it's a quick hug, whether it's a deep hug. And it's all about the motivation behind it. If you like someone, you hug them, mm -hmm. if you're comfortable with hugging. And it all helps stimulate this part of the brain. Does it really? Yeah. And if it's more motivating... So if there's somebody in particular that you like and you, uh, that's the postman, I told you the turn up. <laughs> your, your, your little dogs. <laughs> that's okay. We're animal friendly on this show. That uh, the brain processes it and goes, do I like this hug? Do I like this person? Is it motivating? Mm-hmm. And if it is, if it ticks all those and says yes, you're going to do it more often. If you know, that's more... so true because, like, I'm pet sitting at the moment and I'm looking after the most gorgeous cockapoo and he gives the most awesome hugs and every morning, like, I'll wake up and he'll be there by the bed and then he'll jump up onto the bed and just hug me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you look forward to that. I do. So that releases the positive endorphins and the oxytocin, which makes us feel happier. Mm -hmm. So if, if somebody doesn't like a hug then, is it because they've got um, an association to um, like a, a bad experience of being hugged? It could be a bad experience. It could be a sensory processing problem. The, the body isn't processing that touch. Mm -hmm. Because people with autism... Uh, they, people naturally think they don't like touch. Quite often, it's the type of touch. Okay. 
So some people might like a really deep hug because that makes them feel secure. But a light touch might feel like a thousand ants on the body. Yeah. And it's how their body is processing that information. So, so for people with autism then, what's the best way to actually determine what type of touch is best for them? If possible, ask them. And then give them some examples. Yeah. Of, yeah. Uh, it's about interacting and saying, is this okay? Let them have the control over the situation. Let them hug you mm -hmm. and see how that hug feels. Right. That's really useful. So it's about understanding where they're coming from rather than us stepping into their world. Sorry, uh, uh, rather than we're us asking them to step into our world, we need to step into their world. Yeah. And start to understand. Cool. This also part of the brain, the cingulate gyrus, also plays an, a role in executive functioning, which is where we need to forward plan and uh, actually understand things more. Again, this is an area that people with autism quite often have difficulty in. So it's showing that there might be an impairment on this part. The amygdala. Now, I love the amygdala. What does this do? Now, this part of the brain assesses sensory information. It looks at the sympathetic nervous system. It triggers the stress reaction. Uh, it looks at decision making. It looks at emotional response. And again, it links in with memory. The amygdala is what controls our responses. Ah. You know when you're saying about... Uh, people having bad experience of a hug. Yeah. The amygdala is the part that actually processes it and sends it to be stored and would process and say, hold on a minute, is this something I need to be aware of? Do I not like this? Do I run? Do I send adrenaline out? Do I get the fight or flight hormones ready to go and the cortisol? Or is this something I like? Okay. The amygdala is forever assessing the situation, looking for risks, looking for what might be a good outcome, what might be a bad outcome. This is the part that always is looking for danger. This is our risk assessment, assessor. Now, if the amygdala has processed something and it may be faulty, it's got a false association to something, can we reprogram that? Yeah. Cool. Uh, we'll go a bit into that later. But what you've got to consider with the amygdala is that it can be hijacked. With what? So if we've had a previous experience which has been negative... So, for instance, if someone has maybe drowned in a swimming pool well, and during a swimming lesson, smelling chlorine would take them back to that incident. And the hijack is, the minute they smell that chlorine, the brain goes alerted and will take them back to that incident, release all the cortisol, release all the hormones around the fight or flight and will increase the anxiety for them to move out of the situation. So it's like it's, it's created a negative anchor, which yes. takes you immediately back to that experience. Yeah. The problem is with the hijack, amygdala hijack, is we don't always re remember what the incident is. This could have happened when they were a few months old. Maybe the mum dipped the head under the water in the bath. Hmm. And never thought anything of it. That it might be a one-month-old baby that's had an experience, not out of cruelty or anything, any harm, but just a simple experience that's been held with them. So you, we might not have a conscious memory of it either. Yeah, it's really hard to work with cognitively. 
I can really appreciate that because it must be so difficult for uh, parents because, of course, at that age, you wouldn't have a diagnosis of ADD, ADHD, no. autism. You wouldn't actually know that that child is hypersensitive. No. So you don't uh, know what false associations have been created, do you? Yeah. But also, cognitively, we can rationalise our way out of situations. But if you haven't got that processing ability or the communication or the flexible thinking, which we're looking at the triad of impairments, how do you actually negotiate, negotiate your way through that situation? Yeah. It makes it all the harder. How do you actually problem solve when you don't realize what the problem is? Yeah. And that's why the amygdala is so important because it un underpins everything. And if you notice, uh, when you, if you ever look at the picture of the amygdala, there's actually two amygdalas, and there's one on each hemisphere. Mm -hmm. Each one reacts differently. So the one on the right hemisphere will look at more negative experiences. And the ones on the left hemisphere look at more positive experiences. Ah. So again, whichever amygdala fires first controls quite often the outcome. So if people naturally see negatives, it'd probably be the right one. And it's one of those usual things. If you use it a lot, it fires quicker. So yeah. again, if people have a lot of stress responses, as in autism, that side and the negative experiences will fire an awful lot quicker before we've actually got some positive experiences in. So if we can um, control the stress and reduce the stress and have strategies for that, that then enables the positive side to kick in more and to be programmed in more. The one Brilliant. thing that you've got to remember is that a lot of the interventions we use nowadays start with a cognitive level. So we've mm -hmm. got CBT, neuro linguistics, all start with a logical processing approach. And that is all in the frontal lobe. Now, if we consider in the frontal lobe that that is our conscious brain, if there is a fault within the limbic system, no matter how much input we put into the conscious brain and the frontal lobe, when something goes wrong in the limbic system, it all crumbles. So we're actually working in the wrong way. We haven't got strong foundations. We haven't got that base part which holds ev all the, everything else up, all the structures up. And that's sometimes where things are going wrong because people are working on interventions to put things in place. But again, when the person gets stressed, they've got to access that emotional regulation side to know what to put in place, when to put it in place. If the emotions and the hormones hit first, you haven't got a chance. Wow. So we're actually working in the wrong way. So yes, they can access some of those interventions some of the time, but eventually they will have what's known as a meltdown because the limbic system says, hey, I've had enough. I'm going into a meltdown and I'm shutting down because I can't cope with this. Gosh. So if there's a fault within the limbic system, you will always have a meltdown. It might be three times a year instead of weekly. So it does help working cognitively, but it doesn't solve the actual issue because the fault's within the limbic system. Okay, are there any other parts of the brain that we need to know about? Yes, there's mirror neurons. Now, mirror neurons uh, are found in a variety of places in the brain. And the reason I brought this up is because it, works with the limbic system. We don't know a lot about the mirror neurons. The problem we've got is that they only work when people are alive. 
which, yes, you would say that's logical with the rest of the brain. However, we can look at the other parts of the brain and know how they work and understand them. The problem we've got with mirror neurons is they only fire when the work, when someone's alive. So we can only study them when people are alive. Mm -hmm. And that means we can't cut the heads open and look at what's happening. So we have to do it electronically, which only gives us one angle of the picture. So, and they're only just realizing that mirror neurons actually exist for a start. Mirror neurons fire when we're watching someone. So this is thought to be our empathy center. So I see you picking up a drink, which instantly triggers me to think, I'll have a drink as well. The mirror neurons have actually instigated that because I'm mirroring your interactions. So this is why we yawn when we see somebody else yawning. Yes. yes. It's catching. Yes, it is. Yeah. So it helps with that empathy side. It helps with cognitive functioning because, again, if we are cognitively aware of what's happening and understand other people's emotions, we can adapt to them. So again, if we consider what I was saying earlier on about the lack of understanding and the flexible thinking, it's possibly that the motor neurons and the mirror neurons are actually having a, an impact. And if they're not interlinked with the limbic system enough, then we're not getting the right hormones and we're not getting the right responses. So that's why I've put that part in. And again, which leads on to the olfactory. Because all, again, the olfactory isn't part of the limbic system. However, the olfactory works very closely with the amyg amygdala. And it processes information, which is then packed onto the hippocampus to be remembered. Which so like, when, by the olfactory, do you mean like, is this your smell, when you smell yeah. something? Yeah. Thanks. So it's going back to, we can smell cut grass. And it might take us back to a memory. What that has actually happened is we smell cut grass. It triggers the amygdala, which then says, this is a nice event. We like this nice event. Let's store it in the hippocampus. So next time we smell cut grass, we remember some, that happy feeling. And that's how the olfactory can affect our moods and the smells. It's constantly under neurogenesis it has a top-down formation so not only does it work one way so it doesn't only send information to the amygdala the amygdala sends information back to the olfactory bulb so it's constantly transitioning the information backwards and forwards it can modify odor detection which is why it speaks to the amygdala so it's saying is this enough and if it's too much how can i turn it down mm -hmm. which is why when we're smelling stuff which we know with the aromatherapy oils quite often we only smell them for the first 15 minutes and then we forget about the smells mm -hmm. that's because the brain's processed them it knows what they are and it's saying right i've had enough of them now switch it off we haven't stopped having the benefits of the oils. We just don't need to keep smelling them. And this is the brain's way of switching it off to make sure we don't get overloaded. Mm -hmm. Now, again, if there's a problem here, people might get overloaded with lots of smells and have too many smells. So we know, again, there's a problem within the amygdala. We have, okay. We've actually, with autism, have said that they can smell someone putting hand cream in the room next door. Really? Yeah. Because the sensory processing is so heightened. We've got people saying that they can hear electricity going through the wires. My word. 
So if it's that heightened, can you imagine someone with an olfactory that's that heightened walking through the Trafford Centre, which oh. is a shopping area for those that don't know? That would be a nightmare. Yes. Well, you've got body odour, perfumes, the lush shop, nightmare. You've got disinfectants, you've got anything in that environment which creates a smell. And these are smells that we don't even recognise. Gosh. All those being put into your brain and you've got to process them all. You, you mentioned a term there called neurogenesis. What does that actually mean? It's not something that I've come across. Right, neurogenesis is around the production of new neurons. Yes, mm -hmm. we're always producing new neurons. And the neurons always make new pathways. So if you learn something, you make a new pathway. The more you learn it, the stronger it gets. So if you think about learning a new task, initially, it's, I always explain it, it's like road systems. So initially, you've got a dirt track, which is bump, bumpy and hard to go along. The more you use it, it then becomes a B road, then an A road, then it becomes a dual carriageway and a motorway. Mm -hmm. Messages along the motorways can move faster and smoother. So that's why it works quicker. And the reason it works quicker is because of neurogenesis, because it builds up that connection. And in, you can imagine a newborn baby, neurogenesis is happening tremendously fast and a huge amount because it has to put in all those pathways for the brain to understand the world that the baby's been born into now after a few years it starts to slow down and we don't do it as much unless we're actually learning something new and it's important to keep that neurogenesis production happening to keep our brain active However, the olfactory bulb is constantly under this process. It has to constantly renew its genes because if it's not renewing them, it can't relay the information to the brain adequately and can cause us to lose our sense of smell for a start, cause problems in the brain, and it needs to have fresh genes all the time. Uh, it's just the way it's made. So that is what neurogenesis is all about. Does that help? Yeah, thank you for that. So what else do you want to tell us? So what, well, you know, why is smell important? What does it actually do? Right. Because we've talked so much about the brain, but we're here to talk about oils. As well. Yeah, and, and can you talk about specifically for autism? So when we're thinking about smell, and we've talked about the processing in that, it actually helps form, a, form the brain. One of our first senses to be activated at birth is smell. Because as the baby's born, it naturally picks up the odour of the mother if it's a normal birth. By normal birth, do you mean coming down the birth canal? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that helps with attachment because it always helps to know and make people feel secure if they know who the parents are. Mm -hmm. And that form of smell actually instigates that at attachment, which is now why they're looking at when babies are born, especially if it's cesarean, they try and put them on the mother as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. So the baby's getting that smell, although, if you think about it, because of the actual process, the first smell that baby's going to have is probably going to be a medical smell, mm. a disinfectant or something like that. 
So that's why they're now trying to get the baby straight onto the mum to help with that attachment. That attachment kickstarts the brain. A lot of people with autism can have problems around attachment. So if they have a problem with their sense of smell, that can impair how, the, how well they attach to other people. Uh, although not necessarily linked to autism, a decreased olfactory function can indicate an, an early onset of dementia. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that we've got to consider is that people with autism on the, within the autistic spectrum quite often have a predisposition to early onset of dementia. Is that right? Yeah, they can do. Okay. So it's really important then that we um, activate the sense of smell. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because it's one of those typical ones. If we don't activate it properly, it can lead to other problems, which again, I'll go a bit into for later on. Okay. Uh, it, our sense of smell alerts us to risks. So again, with autism, if we're very risk aware and we can smell something and it's a different smell, how do we know it's safe to eat? So again, people on the autistic spectrum have a very limited diet often and they stick to what they know. And quite often that could come from an issue with smell. They might not try strongly smelling foods because it's overstimulating. Ah. And the sense of smell might pick it up differently to what we smell it as. And it doesn't smell appetizing, so they don't go there. Okay. Their first experience of food is actually smelling the mother or the bottle during breastfeeding or bottle feeding. And milk is a very mellow smell, as long as it's not gone off. And a very bland smell. So quite often they attach to, this is safe. This is what food is. So if we suddenly bring in highly smelly foods, they go, I don't like this. I can't cope with it. Mm. So again, that can impact on what they eat, how they process food and other sensory issues. Smell is one of the few things that doesn't cross the opposite side of the brain. It comes into whichever sense. So if you breathe in through the right nostril, it'll go to the left side of the brain. And if you breathe in through the left nostril, it goes in through the right side of the brain. Huh. Be uh, because most of the brain parts they swap over and they send the information that they'll take it from one side and swap it over to the other side with smell it doesn't so if you've got one nostril which is blocked you're only receiving the information to one part of the brain so that will again differentiate how you process the information my goodness, so if somebody's got a cold and they've got one nostril that's blocked, that can actually impact so many different functions. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. So it's really important that we keep the airways open. Yeah. Because wow. On so much. Uh, and we're just self saying that if we can actually put smell back in there, we actually restore other parts of the brain. So when we've got a cold, it actually affects our sense of taste. We can't taste things. That's so true. And often we actually minimize our sense of smell. We don't recognize it, we take it for granted. We recognize our eyes, we recognize our taste because the, we put them as a priority. But actually the nose is in the middle of the two. Gosh, this is fascinating. <laughs> and if we don't process what we're smelling, what we visually see is impaired, and also what we taste is impaired. Mm. But we don't look after the nose or the sense of smell. You touched on before about 
what can impact on the sense of smell? Yes, mm -hmm. we've got illness, we've got hay fever, we've got sinusitis and all that lot. We've also got pollutants in the environment. We've got loads of fake scents. The brain is wired to know this is a risk. So this is within the limbic system again. We will smell something and we will go, this bread is off. Because not only do I see green mold on it, but I smell it. How mm -hmm. often do we pick up something and we smell it first? Even though it looks healthy to eat, we'll smell it and then we go, oh, it doesn't smell right. Yeah. We know there's something wrong with it. So then we go and put it back. Or we put it in the bin. Now, what's happening a lot, and there's no evidence to support this, so it's only hypothetical. And to me, I would like a bit more research around it. But we've got dangerous substances, chemicals. For instance, we'll take an everyday one, bleach. Bleach used to smell like bleach years ago. You would smell bleach and you go, this is not very nice. And instantly our brain would go, yuck, we don't want to be near that danger because of the smell of it. What we're doing nowadays is we're putting pretty flower smells over the top of the bleach. And it's confusing our brain. So when the brain smells the bleach now, it smells the pretty flowers. And then it goes, oh, that's nice. And it goes, hold on a minute, there's an underlying smell. Is this a smell that I can trust because the flowers are there? Or is there an underlying smell that I don't trust? And it's confusing our brain. Now what happens if our brain's confused? Anxiety goes up. We don't know how to cope with it. And if we don't understand what is safe and what is not safe, we've got constant anxiety. Yeah. Because the amygdala is firing all the time and putting those hormones into our body. So again, these nice things that smell nice, I'm worried because a lot of them are chemical based and we don't know what's happening within these chemicals and we haven't done enough tests to see what is it doing to our brain yeah so to be on the safe side if we look at using safe natural alternatives to the chemicals that's going to reduce the stress levels because it's yeah. not confusing the brain and it's yeah. not overloading the body with toxins anyway because everything yeah. that we breathe in is getting absorbed into the bloodstream and then having another impact yeah i get that thank you so it also the more we smell the better the olfactory works. Mm -hmm. so, so, long yeah. as, so long as we are smelling the right. things that aren't chemicals. Yeah. But even smelling chemicals, it's still triggering the olfactory. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those, if you use it, it'll strengthen. If you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah. However, again, if you abuse it with too many fake things. Yeah. I do wonder if that impacts on the loss of it as well. Yeah. So the key, the key really from what you're saying there is to stimulate the olfactory, but not to cause the stress. So stick to the natural stuff is better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. And again, if there's brain injury within the brain, uh, limbic system, you quite often find that our sense of smell is skewed. So it's imperative to understand that the limbic system and our sense of smell are interlinked, mm -hmm. totally interlinked. Cool. So, I mean, you're talking about, um, you know, a lot of things here. Um, what do we need to look at next? What we've got to consider is if the limbic system's triggering, we've got what all the hormones which are being triggered. So... We recognise with an autism that they've got a predisposition to depression. Mm. So we know quite often serotonin. 
is one of the neurotransmitters which is used very much around uh, depression. If you've got more serotonin in your system, you don't tend to be depressed. Mm -hmm. If you've got a deficiency in it, you tend to worry more, you have low self-esteem, guilt, OCD behaviours, irritability, poor sleep and control issues. And then you go, hold on a minute, let's look at what people with autism have. And it could be a, a low serotonin. Yes, we can eat food, which can give us a higher serotonin level. Yes, we can do activities. Uh, also, food that we eat can have an impact on our serotonin levels. So chocolate, sweets, that can actually lower our serotonin levels. It can lower it? Yes. Okay. And tobacco and things like that can all impact on our serotonin levels. Mm -hmm. However, there's essential oils that we can use which boost the serotonin levels such as basil. Basil's fantastic at clearing overwhelmed feelings. So if someone's feeling really, really overwhelmed, smell basil. If you haven't got basil oil, get a sprig of basil. Mm -hmm. If you've got herbs in your garden, crush it between your fingers, smell it. It's a really good calming smell. Mm -hmm. And also using it in cooking. It has that effect because if we're in taking in the properties in our cooking, we're still getting the benefits of it. Roman chamomile is another good one for helping to calm and boost serotonin. Again, all time favorite frankincense. Again, is a serotonin, serotonin booster, mm -hmm. uranium and helichrysum. Hel that's another one I can't say. Helichrysum. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Never get my tongue around that one. All those are fantastic at serotonin. Uh, it just boosts them. So it, they make us feel happy. Yeah. We've also got other neurotransmitters which can have an impact on us. So we've got adrenaline and dopamine and norepinephrine, something like that. Can't you tell I'm wonderful with words? Uh, now, a deficiency in them means a lack of drive, poor concentration. You're talking your ADD, your ADHD, and it also affects your thyroid. So if our thyroid's affected, we're going to feel tired, lethargic. And again, it's a lack of, quite often, these neurotransmitters. Again, we've got oils that help. Vetiver and lavender, good combination. Because the vetiver helps with focus and lavender helps with attention. So putting the two together really helps people with ADHD. Oh, brilliant. Again, basil and frankincense. Very good for these neurotransmitters. Lemongrass and rosemary. Again, trigger these neurotransmitters, the production of uh, these hormones which are essential to everyday life. We've also got the last one, which is called GABA, which I will say this slowly, and it's gamma aminobutyric acid. Now you know why they call it GABA. <laughs> what does, okay, so go on. What does that? Um, a deficiency in this means tense muscles, you can't relax, you're anxious and uptight. So again, thinking back to autism, that there might be a chemical imbalance. And again, if the limbic system is not working properly, that is the main hub for releasing the chemicals and controlling them. So it might not be regulating the information correctly. The oils we can use for the, this area is geranium, because it releases nervous tension. It's fantastic at relaxing the body. Uh, they call it the poor man's rose. Mm -hmm. A rose is very good, but geranium seems to do it a bit better. 
Well, that's good because it's cheaper as well. Yeah, and it's good because it's a lot cheaper. <laughs> Again, basil. And if you think about it, basil covers all these three areas. Uh, mm. So if you really need a mood lifter, get your basil out. And it, yeah, I bet you most people wouldn't go to basil. They'd go for lavender, they'd go for rose, all those type of things. But basil's one of your best ones. Yeah, I can appreciate that, actually. I actually did, um, this is going off subject a little bit, but I did a, a tantra workshop where we were exploring smell and we were blindfolded, so we didn't know what we were smelling. And they brought my essential oils around, actually, in the class. And when I smelt the basil, it was, oh, what is that? And, and I thought, oh, wow, that is amazing. I didn't realise that that basil was so uplifting until I had that experience of... Um, the sensory impairment, so I was just using yeah. the sense of smell. But again, what were we saying before? We use our eyes mm. and our taste before we use our nose. Yeah. We really, really need to exercise our nose more. Yeah. Because it, it's stuck in the middle of our face, <laughs> <laughs> literally, and we're not using it. Mm. But it underpins everything else. It impacts on everything yeah. and how the brain focuses and how we deal with emotions. And it's so neglected. Uh, other ones we've got after basil is peppermint, rosemary and yangalang. Those are all good ones for your GABA transmitters. Uh, and how easy is it to lose weight? We've got to run around the block. To actually exercise our, our nose, grab something and smell it. Yeah. It, it doesn't take long. But so so you, you've, you, you've, go on, you've mentioned quite a few oils there, Jude. You know, like what's, if people were to um, get started, what's the best way for them to actually do so? Well, there's different oils for different things. And we were talking about autism. So actually, when we're talking about the different hemispheres, it's about sometimes understanding what the oils do. Mm -hmm. So there's actual smells. I won't say oils, yeah. but smells that trigger particular hemispheres. So again, if we've got one hemisphere which is a bit lazy whether it's the right or the left, we can actually trigger that hemisphere, which again, within autism, that might be helpful. Mm -hmm. Or again, if we are working in one hemisphere more than the other, so we might not be logical, so we need to get the left hemisphere working more, then there's actually smells we can do for that. So the smells for the right hemisphere, a black pepper, Burnt wood, coffee, eucalyptus, fish oil, lemon, lime, mustard, onion, and peppermint. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at that, the very, what I would call, quite, apart from the lemon and lime, quite earthy, mm -hmm. earthy smells. For the left hemisphere, you're looking at apple, banana, cherry, chocolate. See, we found a good positive re reason to smell chocolate. <laughs> uh, grape. Orange, pineal, pineapple, rose, strawberry. All those are really good for impacting on the left hemisphere. and stimulating that side of the brain. Yeah. So again, we can use them for autism. So if someone's very, very rigid, which we know it happens with autism, it's about using the mixture of the smells. There are other good autism smells because it's about recognizing that stuff like rosemary, another good herb, is fantastic for boosting the memory 
but also a lot of people on the autistic spectrum have difficulties with transitioning so moving from one activity to another rosemary oil especially works well at this transition yeah because it calms the body down and helps us move from one activity to another so it not only with autism but for anyone who has problems or if you've got an anxiety on a traveling on a journey have just a sprig of rosemary or a rosemary oil and just smell it yeah it helps arbo vitae helps with flexibility it gives you that relaxed feeling it brings out trust so again if you've got someone with a lot of anxiety and doesn't trust what's happening around them part of that anxiety will be because they can't trust the world yeah so bringing in that oil helps with that side and to really ground them it's a really good grounding oil that um helps them feel calmer again I've, very, <laughs> I've mentioned it before basil again if you're overwhelmed if you're anxious or if you've got a sugar addiction remember what we're saying about sugar impacting on the the serotonin levels and all those yeah a lot of people can get addicted to sugar oh gosh people on the spectrum yeah well they say that sugar is more addictive than cocaine it's exactly. one of the most addictive substances on the planet which causes yeah. other health issues as well yeah i didn't know that uh, basil was good for that so thank you so it can help with that cedar wood this is helps with connecting with people and social bonds so again with autism we know they have problems with social side so by bringing in cedar wood you can help with that the other interesting fact with cedar wood is if you're learning new skills we need oxygen to the brain mm. because oxygen to the brain helps build those connections cedar wood naturally takes oxygen to the brain and promotes it Peppermint does the same as well, doesn't it? That increases oxygenation. It does, but it's not as efficient as using cedar wood. Oh, brilliant. That's good to know. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, see, peppermint does it because it clears the airways and makes transition of oxygen easier to the brain. Yeah. Cedar wood, it actually tells the brain to get the oxygen there. So it's slightly working differently. Brilliant. Uh, so I would always say if someone's learning something new and they want it to be more efficient, get your cedar wood out. Okay. You've got clary sage for hormone regulation. Yeah. It works really good with females, but it also works really good for males. So anyone with a high testosterone the clary sage can help level that out. And again, if we're triggering the limbic system and we want the hormones to be looked at and worked on, then clary sage is a good one for that. Presumably that would also work on low testosterone as well because yes. the oils work to balance the system, don't they? Yes, that's right. Okay. Yeah, it, it does whatever's needed, whether it's to heighten or to decrease. Yeah, I'm making loads of notes here. Thank you, continue. <laughs> <laughs> right one which isn't available in england as yet but soon will be is kabaya now this is fantastic for anxiety focus and self-awareness now i've recently used this arm with someone who's got adhd and it was one of those did a rollerball said try it see how it goes and the young lady in question Mum just updated me, it was fantastic. The mum was using it on her to help her with her anxiety, and her anxiety was coming down, not half as many meltdowns whatsoever from mm -hmm. using it. But we put in a few other interventions around explaining why we were using it 
at that key time and the young lady in question she's only a child has out actually started accessing it herself now goes to get the rollerball when she's feeling anxious applies it herself and calms down well so that's wonderful because she's been empowered to look after yeah. her own needs yeah and she's recognizing which means she can do something about it brilliant but also because it's bringing down the anxiety it's also meaning she can process things easier yeah and put other things in place so she's learned that using that oil has this effect therefore she's got a positive reaction to it and it just motivates her to use it all the more brilliant now you mentioned that uh, at the moment we can't get that i know we use doTERRA's oils and we will be able to get these after the european convention in may uh, 2018 so that's really yeah. good news yes brilliant uh, and i think it's only recognized within doTERRA isn't it i don't think it's a an oil which is like lavender which you can get in different forms i think yeah well yeah well we can we can talk about uh, sourcing oils at the end yeah we've got cyprus which helps with flexibility again trust and to go with the flow of life because it's again very relaxing and it encourages people to just go with it mm -hmm. so again if you've got people who are very rigid again that helps promote those sides geranium which we we're saying before trust again and loving and tolerance, mm -hmm. tolerance as well. Lavender, Old Faithful, is relaxing, but also people don't realize lavender can be used to open communication. Yeah, very good for expression, isn't it? Yes. So if you've got someone who can't express themselves, lavender can help open that side. Mm -hmm. And then orange is used for energizing, mood stabilizing, and sense of fun. Because again, we don't always recognize that it's hard work being autistic. Yeah. And they don't have enough fun. They need that inner child activating. They need that sense of fun. They need that liveliness yeah. to actually help them through the day. Because everything's so serious sometimes. And yeah. we need a good laughter because it helps everything else. Of course. So orange is good for that that is just a few there's loads of oils which can be used mm -hmm. but it's about looking at the individual mm -hmm. and making sure you understand which oil is best for which situation what behaviors are you actually seeing mm -hmm. and then working backwards and saying right if we've got this type of behavior it's anxiety related right which oils help anxiety mm -hmm. okay so that, make, that makes sense because we've got a lot of oils there and you know people can sort of start to work with what three three or four yeah i would say the the best way to start is to identify what behavior problems you've got yeah look at what oils support those areas and then do yourself a little program yeah and maybe set a budget and then you can schedule them in over a period of time. Yep. Because ideally what we need to think about is why does this work? Yeah. Because again, that helps us to motivate us to do it. We're working from the inside out. Because if we're getting the limbic system working, we're working at source. As I mentioned before, no matter how much cognitive therapy we do, if the limbic system says I've had enough and closes down or has a meltdown, no cognitive thinking is going to actually rescue that. Yeah. So by exercising, by using the oils, we can actually work from the inside, working outwards. Oils, are one of the few things that can go through the blood brain barrier. So again, they can get through into the inner workings of the brain. 
we've got to look at how frequent we do it. Frequency, intensity, and duration is vital to any exercise. So it's not, about, it's not about smelling it once then. It's about yeah. continually doing it and retraining the brain. Yeah. Okay. If there's a problem, so if we're thinking about someone with autism, where we know there's a definite problem there, we have to look at maybe doing it five times a day. Mm -hmm. If someone with a really serious issue, you might think 10 times a day. Mm -hmm. And it is literally taking the lid off, smell it, take three deep breaths, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And you might pick five oils. Because if you think about five oils, you're exercising quite a bit because we're changing the smell. So we're having to get the brain to go, oh, what's this smell? What's this smell? Ah, so it's not getting used to the same one. Yes. But also, if you use one smell, we're only triggering one thing. Oh, I see. So if we use different smells, it's like when you go to the gym. If you go to the gym and you stay on one equipment, you only build up one response. Yeah. If we're using different oils to smell, we're actually giving the whole of the limbic system a workout. Yeah. Rather than just concentrating on one area. Brilliant. Because if we've got the whole limbic system working well together, then we've got a whole organ working rather than the amygdala working, but the rest of it isn't. So if somebody's tried um, essential oils before and they've got like a child with autism, but they've only been using one or two oils, they may not see the same results then? No, no. Oh, because that makes total sense. On, yeah. We've only been working on one aspect of it. Yeah, that makes total sense. So we've got to use them a lot. Some people might turn around and say, but my child's hypersensitive to smell, so I can't use them. And it's like, no, you can you just have to do it at a slower pace. Mm -hmm. So it might be you open the bottle of aromatherapy oil at the other side of the room. Mm -hmm. What you're looking for is a response. So the response might be they twitch the nose, they rub the nose, they move away. Mm -hmm. or they go like that. Like a, a sniff, yeah. sniff up. Yeah. What's that smell? Yeah. The brain has registered it. That's all we need initially. Yes, okay. we're not going to have the optimum effect, but what you do is you do that little and often with the different smells and gradually do a desensitization program and bring it closer to the child to the point where you can get them to smell them underneath the nose. We are talking this might take a month easy before you can get the oil anywhere near them. It might take six months. Yeah. It isn't a quick fix. However, the benefits when you get there are fantastic. Yeah. Because as well, it, you'll find that with all the different smells, if you've got someone with an aversion of eating particular foods, bring in food smells. So if you've only got something like two aromatherapy oils and you're thinking... I can't do this program. I can't pick five smells. Don't worry. Start with your two aromatherapy oils. Bring in food smells. Brilliant. So you can bring in lemon. You can bring in orange. And actually smell an orange. Yeah. Uh, bring in mint. Crush it. And again, if you've got a child who's got a sensitivity to smell, that might be at a lower level. So you can replace a peppermint sprig with peppermint oil eventually well is there like if somebody just used food would that have the same impact as the oils it takes longer okay so it can have a good impact but it does take an awful lot longer because the essential oils are very potent aren't they yeah. i mean one drop of doTERRA's peppermint oil is the equivalent to 28 cups of peppermint yeah. tea it's very very potent. yeah you can't get around that one yeah uh it also works because we've got brain plasticity. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something that's being bandied around a lot more now. Because we're recognising that the brain actually changes. 
We used to think that the brain stopped form formation at the age of three. And it was set in stone. However, we now realize the brain doesn't stop growing until the age of 25. Oh. And after that, it continues to regenerate. Which is why me and you, Deborah, can learn something new. Yeah. We can go out and learn to play the ukulele. If we didn't have brain plasticity and the ability for our brain to rejuvenate and change, we couldn't learn that as a new skill. Okay. So the fact that we can change the brain means we, we can repair it. Brilliant. Uh, this is being used an awful lot more. Slight diversion is that there are systems and therapies that will work on that brain plasticity to actually bring in new skills. So developmental stages which may have been lost in the early years, such as crawling, which has a massive impact on the brain, we can go back and redo the crawling and put those processes into the brain again, which helps with the autism and uh, also helps with a lot of other conditions because we're finding that children have missed out those brain developments. Yeah, so it's not necessarily a good thing for children to start work, walking at an early age, is it? Oh, because no. they're no. missing that crossover, yes. which stimulates the right and left hemisphere. Yes, but also, a bit of information, that crossover and the crawling impacts on our re ability to read. Good grief. And our spatial awareness, because when you're on your hands and knees and you're crawling, you're judging the distance between the floor and your face, mm -hmm. which gets spatial awareness in. You're also scanning the floor as you're moving with your left and he right hemispheres. And it's the same movement that we use when we're scanning a page. Mm -hmm. So good crawlers tend to be quick readers. Mm -hmm. And the ones that didn't crawl are the slower readers. So all these parts of the development impact on our brain. And if we haven't done it, then yes, we can compensate, but the brain isn't working as efficiently as it could do. For instance, I've got flat feet. I didn't actually combat crawl. When I didn't crawl, actually. So all this information, I'm going, yeah, that ticks my box, that ticks my box. But... I didn't combat crawl, and the combat crawl engages the big toe and creates the curvature in your foot. Wow. So children that don't combat crawl have a predisposition to having flat feet. Gosh, you're in my field of information. So there are therapies that work on those areas. But it all impacts on the brain. Mm. And if the brain isn't functioning well, and isn't functioning how it should do, because again, we're changing the environment because we're putting children in walkers. We're putting children, we don't put children face down. We don't have, they're bringing back tummy time now. Mm. We went through an era where we put children on the backs, mm. which impacts on brain development. Yeah. Uh, we've got all to get almost back to what, what we're talking because we divert. Yeah, we need to be quick because we've uh, we're running out of time. I know. <laughs> we, we could talk forever on this subject. Well, the brain is a muscle. Yeah. If you don't exercise it, you lose it, and you can develop it. Yes. Yeah. So again, what we're saying about the contaminants in the in the world that we've got that can impact on the brain. But also, we've got the properties of the oils, which have got healing properties within them. Yeah. So again, those properties are going into our brain. Yeah. 
And, and they're not just working emotionally either, they're working physically, yeah. emotionally and multidimensionally. Yeah. So it covers everything. It covers, as they say, mind, body and spirit. Yeah. Uh, there is some research to support this, but again, there's not much. There's no specific research, although I have a feeling there will be some anecdotal research coming out eventually. Mm -hmm. on the benefits of using the oils in these ways mm -hmm. however the reason we've started to use them in this way is because we've looked at other research and made a logical transition and said well if we can do this with this mm -hmm. then why can't we do it with this yeah in this way they found there's one study which was by mercola and it's called Take Control of Your Health, uh, the website. And they're looking at how essential oils can help with ADHD. Now, they realize that particular oils with ADHD helped reduce the symptoms, if not eradicate them. Yeah. So that is a good uh, website to have a look. I'll repeat it again. It's called Take Control of Your Health. Okay. There is also some research which is for attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, and that's by Friedman, which is, look at it as fried, a man with a double N. Okay. Uh, and he did that in 2001. And again, that's some really useful research. There is more research, which I'm more than happy to pass on to people. I haven't got the, all the documents, but I do have the, the references that people can then look up. Yeah, and people can go on to Google, can't they? And, I was um, going to say. Yeah, and look on there. If they go on to uh, Google Scholar, mm -hmm. they will quite often get the abstracts of a lot of the research. Well, there you go. I didn't even know there was a Google Scholar. Did you not? No, thank you for that. Yeah, if you're looking for research... Google Scholar is actually a really good, and you just put Google Scholar in, and it brings up all the research documents. Wonderful. Jude, thank you so much for uh, sharing all this with us. Um, I mean, one thing I just want to um, bring to people's attention is that not all essential oils are the same, and this is a really key point because uh, the FDA in America say a label, an oil can be labelled as 100% pure on the bottle, but in fact it only needs to contain up to 5% of the real essential oil and the rest of it can be made up of chemicals and synthetics, yet still be labelled 100% pure. So you have to be really discerning where you buy your essential oils from. And we can guide you on that as to, you know, what to look out for when you're sourcing essential oils, uh, what makes uh, an oil therapeutic, because depending on where it's sourced from, gives it its chemistry. Um, so oil, like if you look at lavender, for example, lavender that's grown in France or in Bulgaria, which are the, you know, in the lavender fields, are grown under certain conditions, under certain climates, weathering, soil nutrients, altitude, temperature, all that goes to making up the therapeutic properties of that oil so that if you buy oil that's uh, grown in the UK or in America it's not got the same chemistry and so when you're looking at oils there's, there's more than just going to the local supermarket and buying a bottle of essential oil so what we're talking about here are therapeutic grade essential oils and we're happy to provide ongoing education about that and you know and to give you um, the heads up on what to look for when you're sourcing oils. So Jude, if people want to contact you, how can they do so? Well, they can do it. Uh, I do have my own website, mm -hmm. which is probably the easiest way because uh, if they just put in simply misunderstood Jude, it should bring it up. However, the web address is www simply misunderstood dot co dot uk mm -hmm. and if people want more information on the neurotherapy aspects of it they can get more information because this is where i've learned about the oils 
from www.neurorehabtherapy.co.uk. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It's just been absolutely fascinating. I've taken pages of notes. <laughs> If you find this um, this interview interesting and you know people who do have autism, ADD, ADHD, um, and they want to know more about essential oils, this, uh, this information is like gold dust because it can help so many people. So please do feel free to forward it uh, and do comment on, on the interview. You know, if you see this on, um, on the radio show, or uh, later on it will be on YouTube. So do uh, check us out on that later. So thank you for listening into the Essential Oil Show. I'm Deborah Sophia Magdalene. You can find me on Facebook, and uh, my business page on there is Magdalene Wellness. So thank you, everybody, for listening, and bye for now. <laughs>